What is your favorite proof technique? Is it perhaps proof by contradiction, where you assume the opposite of what you want to prove and then arrive at the contradiction, thus proving the original claim? Or is it constructive proof, where you not only prove the solution exists, but also find the solution itself? Maybe it's proof by induction, where you exploit the structure of natural numbers. My favorite proof technique is the method of double counting, because it not only proves the theorem elegantly, but also provides an explanation as to why the theorem is true. This is precisely the goal of mathematics, to understand why something is true, not just that it is true. In double counting, we count the same set in two different ways. Since these two methods yield the same result, they must be equal. Double counting is used in combinatorics when you want to prove that two formulas are equal. This way, with a little creativity, we avoid tedious inductive derivations, complicated algebraic transformations and shuffling terms around. We will prove five identities using the double counting method, and I hope you will recognize the power of this method. Before that, let's define the binomial coefficient. The binomial coefficient, denoted as n choose k, counts how many ways can we choose k objects from n available. The objects are all different. For example, let our set contain a triangle, a circle, and a square. n equals 3, because there are 3 objects. We want to take k equals 2 objects. There are three ways to do this. To take a triangle and a circle, then a triangle and a square, and finally a circle and a square. We've calculated that 3 choose 2 equals 3. We notice how the order is not important. It doesn't matter whether we take a triangle and a circle, or a circle and a triangle. It only matters what we have taken. Additionally, if k equals 0, then n choose 0 is always 1. This is because we can only take nothing in one way, and that is not to take anything. Also, n choose n is always 1, because it corresponds to taking the whole set. If k is greater than n, then n choose k equals 0, because it is impossible to take more objects than what is currently available. Very simple concept, isn't it? It should be, but it is mostly thought in a way that introduces a new formula with factorials and everything is proven using it. This makes us forget the true, simple meaning of n choose k, which represents the number of ways to choose k objects from n available. In the rest of the video, we will no longer mention this formula, nor will we need it. We will focus on the true meaning of the binomial coefficient. If you are interested in where does the name binomial coefficients come from, the reason is that they appear in algebra as coefficients of the polynomial obtained when the binomial x plus y is raised to the nth power and expanded. This is the connection between combinatorics and algebra, which can also be used when proving theorems. A task for those who want to know more. Why do binomial coefficients appear in this formula? That is, what exactly do they count? Leave your answers in the comments below. Let's use the double counting method to prove the basic property of binomial coefficients. We have n objects from which we want to choose 3. There are n choose 3 ways to do this, by definition. Also, instead of choosing the objects we want to take, we can also choose the ones we don't want and then remove them. There are n choose n minus 3 ways to do this, but since we are counting the same quantity in two ways, these two numbers are equal. That is, n choose 3 equals n choose n minus 3. Of course, there is nothing special about the number 3. The same argument applies to any number k. This identity essentially tells us we can choose and eliminate elements we don't want, instead of choosing those elements we do want. We want to somehow calculate the coefficients using the ones we have already previously calculated. Here we use our next identity. As before, we are choosing three elements from n available.
Pay attention to the first element. There are two possibilities. We can take it or leave it. If we take it, then we choose the remaining two elements from the next n minus 1 elements. There are n minus 1 choose two ways to do this. If we leave it, then we have to take all three elements from the other n minus 1 elements. There are n minus 1 choose three ways to do this. Since both possibilities are correct, we add them up. Again, Nothing special about the number 3. The same argument works for any number k. This is Pascal's identity. It tells us we can either take the first element or not. First, we counted using the definition of the binomial coefficient, and then we counted by considering the first element. Using Pascal's identity and what we know so far about binomial coefficients, we can create a table. Let the rows correspond to the number n and the columns to the number k. We count from zero so we can see all binomial coefficients. It may seem a bit strange that we are placing k above n, but it is clearer this way, as we shall soon see. We know that n choose zero is always one. So we fill column 0 with 1s. The same applies when n is equal to k. Then we have n choose n, which is equal to 1. This corresponds to the diagonal, so we also fill it with 1s. Everything to the right of this diagonal is zeros, because then we are taking more objects than we have available, which is, of course, impossible. These zeros just take up space, and the convention is not to write them down. Now we can fill in the rest of the table using Pascal's identity. Let's remind ourselves that Pascal's identity states n choose k is equal to n minus 1 choose k plus n minus 1 choose k minus 1. Graphically, this means that when we want to calculate the coefficient in a given field, we take the coefficients above and above left and add them up. This way we can go row by row and generate the entire table. Usually, we shift the rows so that they are aligned. We can see that the triangle is symmetric because of the symmetry identity. Now Pascal's identity is even clearer. Any number is equal to the sum of the numbers directly above him. Let's find out how much is 5 choose 3. Columns are now shifted, so they become diagonals. It is in the fifth row and the third diagonal. Just don't forget to start counting from zero. Let's, for fun, calculate the sums for each row of Pascal's triangle. In the zeroth row, the sum is 1. In the first, it is 1 plus 1 equals 2, and so on. We notice a pattern in these sums. It seems that the sum of coefficients in the nth row is 2 to the power of n. Let's prove this by double counting. Imagine, as before, a row of n different objects. We are interested in how many ways can we take any group of objects, regardless of the actual size of the group. For example, we can take these five objects, or these three. We may also not take any objects, or we can take all of them. Essentially, we are counting how many subsets a set of n elements contains. The first way is to go element by element. For the first element, we have two options. Either we will take it or not. That's why we write two. For the second element, we again have two options. So we multiply by two. Same for the third object. So we multiply by two again. And so on. We multiply n times in total. There are 2 to the power of n ways to choose any subset of objects. 
Let's count differently, this time focusing on the size of the group. First, we can take no objects. There is only one way to do that, or equivalently, and choose zero ways. Then we can take just one element, for which there are n ways, or in other words, n choose 1, so we add it to our sum. We can also take two elements, for which there are n choose 2 ways, we add it to the sum as well. We continue this process until we reach n choose n, which represents taking every object. These two ways count the same quantity, so 2 to the power of n is equal to the sum of binomial coefficients in the nth row. We set that the rows correspond to coefficients with the same n, and the diagonals to coefficients with the same k. Let's consider the diagonals. The zero diagonal is not so interesting. It consists only of ones. The first diagonal contains the natural numbers starting from 1. The next diagonal is a little more interesting. It contains the so-called triangular numbers. The nth triangular number represents the sum of the natural numbers up to n. So 1 equals 1, then 3 equals 1 plus 2, 6 equals 1 plus 2 plus 3, and the pattern continues. They are called triangular because they can be represented as points on a triangle. In Pascal's triangle, we can see this visually in the following way. The indicated number is equal to the sum of all the numbers in the previous diagonal up to the row before it. This is technically true for the previous diagonal as well, because for example, there are 5 ones before the number 5. Let's move on to the third diagonal to assure ourselves that this rule is still correct. We see that they are also the sum of the previous triangular numbers. So 1 equals 1, 4 equals 1 plus 3. 10 equals 1 plus 3 plus 6, and so on. These are tetrahedral numbers, named because they can be represented as a tetrahedron. We can see this fact in Pascal's triangle in the same way we did before. This is called the hockey stick theorem, because it kinda looks like a hockey stick. Let's prove that this property persists for the whole of Pascal's triangle. Symbolically, we can write it like this. The sum of the coefficients in the diagonal r up to the row n is equal to n plus 1 choose r plus 1. To illustrate the proof, let r be equal to 3. Again, we have a row of different objects, this time n plus 1 of them. We want to choose 4 of them. There are n plus 1 choose 4 ways to do this by definition. To be more suggestive, we will write 4 as 3 plus 1. Now let's count this differently. Color the rightmost object we will choose with red. We will then have to choose 3 remaining objects to the left of the red object, since it is the rightmost element. We are counting by considering the possibilities of where the red object can be. If it is in the first place, then we have to choose three objects from zero available. Of course, this is impossible, and corresponds to the coefficient zero choose three. For the completeness of the formula, we will write this term as well. We'll see later where these zeros are on the Pascal's triangle. The same is the case when the red object is in the second and the third place, because we don't have enough objects to choose from. These are cases 1 choose 3 and 2 choose 3 in order. When the red object is in the fourth place, then we can take 3 objects from 3 available in just one way. We'll write this as 3 choose 3 to make the pattern clearer. Now the situation gets interesting. When the object is in the fifth place, we have 4 choose 3 which is four possibilities to choose three objects. The pattern is now completely clear, but let's do one more case anyway. When the red object is in the sixth place, we choose from the five objects left of it. We can take three objects in five choose three ways, which is 10. Here are all 10 of them. 
and so on until the red object moves to the last place. Then from n objects we will choose 3. There are n choose 3 ways to do this. We can condense this formula into a sum. The same argument applies for any R. I hope you see not only that we have proven this identity, but now clearly see why this identity is true. Let's see where those first zeros are on Pascal's triangle. If we imagine that the diagonal extends to the top of the triangle, then those are phantom zeros we have decided not to show. So far, we have proven four identities by the method of double counting. If you're still not convinced of the superiority of this method, then I challenge you to prove the following identity using induction. It's not too difficult, but it is tedious and doesn't allow us to understand the meaning of this identity or to generalize it further. This is Wandermann's identity. It tells us how to break down the sum of n plus m in the upper term if we know the binomial coefficients with the upper terms n and m. Imagine a row of n blue and m green objects. We want to take four objects, not caring about their color. There are n plus m choose four ways to do this, by definition. We can count this in another way, this time focusing on the color. We can choose not to take any blue objects and only take green ones. There are n choose 0 times m choose 4 possibilities for this. Then we can take one blue and the remaining three green objects. We have n choose 1 times m choose 3 possibilities for this. Then if we take two blue objects, we have n choose 2 times m choose two ways to do this. The pattern continues until we take all four blue objects and no green ones. We can condense this using the sum notation. Replace four with r, and we have our final formula. Again, we have not only proved the identity, but we also understand the reason why it works. I don't want you to memorize this identity, but the proof itself. So if you ever forget this identity, remember the blue and green objects, and in a minute you will be able to derive the identity by yourself. This identity can be generalized. Let's say that in addition to blue and green, we also have red objects. I'm running out of letters for variables, so let's say we have n1 blue, n2 green, and n3 red objects. we get the following more general identity. We want to take R objects. By definition, there are N1 plus N2 plus N3 choose R possibilities for this. On the other hand, we can consider the colors of objects similar to last time and get the right hand side. For each triplet K1, K2 and K3, whose sum is R, we add N1 choose K1 times N2 choose K2 times n3 choose k3. We can generalize this identity for any number of groups of objects. The next step is four groups. You can visualize how the proof for this identity would go. Just imagine adding n4 yellow objects. There is no reason to stop at four. This is the most general form of Vandermont's identity. For those of you who are truly brave, prove this identity using induction. Let's go back to the case with two groups. Something special happens when m, n, and r are all equal. We replace all variables with n, except for k, which is a counting variable. On the left-hand side, we have n2 choose n. On the right, we have a sum over k of terms n choose k times n choose n minus k. Using the identity we proved at the beginning of the video, we can replace n choose n minus k with n choose k, and we turn the product into a square. In other words, if we square the binomial coefficients in one row, then add them up, 
we get a central term in the row with twice the index. By the way, this term 2n choose n is called a central binomial coefficient. It often appears in mathematics. Using it, we can very well approximate the number of prime numbers less than a given value, or prove that there is always a prime number between n and 2n for any number n. It also appears in Catalan numbers, which are very important in combinatorics. These are all topics I would like to cover some other time. Let's recap. We've proven five identities without factorials, complicated algebraic transformations, and inductive proofs. Instead, we did what even children know, and that's counting. Along the way, we also understood what these identities are trying to convey to us. And we got that understanding along with the proof. Each proof technique is like a tool. It has its appropriate applications and its limits. But I hope I have convinced you of the power of double counting method and its elegance. Thank you for sticking with me on this journey.